the type of uh, film stock that we're going to use, the cameras, the bringing the animation in, and, uh, and just the whole package. And then the, the process, I think, was a, a group thing where we, we started at one point and we went one way and we stopped and came back and went another direction and we stopped and came back. And, and it was just uh, three people sitting, talking, looking at the film, shooting, shooting again, getting into rushes, editing. And light bulbs are great to work with. <laughs> you don't have to feed them. <laughs> when they burn out, you put another light bulb in. <laughs> it's very refreshing after doing a narrative film. Yeah. <laughs> I have sort of a, a two-part question. First, are, are the light sculptures usually shown in just sort of a, a real-life environment for people to look at? And if, and if so, was it different for you to have to try to translate that into the two-dimensional world of, you know, of a movie screen? Well, yeah, uh, I do a lot of installation work in galleries, that, that type of thing. I wanted to, uh, we went at it to start with thinking about the possibility of a, of a sort of a documentation of the sculptures. And I wanted to try to push that uh, to where the from my point of view, the sculpture actually became a piece of film. Uh, so these, these sculptures, uh, instead of being used as tools in an overall installation, they became kind of tools to make a film. So it, it, it wasn't a hard, uh, a hard transition at, at all, but we, there were some things that we could do with film that my sculptures didn't do on their own. Mm -hmm. and, and uh, those were the things I looked at more than anything. The, the animation, the, the, the strobing effects with the shadows in the, in the film, the, uh, the frames per second, uh, which, is, which is some things we're, we're looking at further to experiment with. Just try to push it, uh, push it around and play with it. So I'm thinking about there. doing 50 hertz, which will be the European version. <laughs> <laughs>
to use an animation and a live action situation that uh, sort of confused what we would think as animation as just being something that's not real, even though it doesn't appear to be real to us. Anybody else? On, on more of a, a technical level, was the some of the shots that you did on video, just like the panoramic shots of, of, of nature, were you manipulating color with that at all? That, it's sort of difficult to tell if that was just the footage as shot or if there was something going um, on after the fact. Yeah, some of the shots were manipulated. Um, some of them were taken in to uh, Photoshop or another paint program, frame by frame, and uh, manipulated in, in that respect for After Effects, which is another right. type of layout program, um, and stretched a little bit and uh, broken up in different areas. So. One part where the water is going down the rocks. Yeah. It, it, it is the is the water is that light is that from the computer or how did you accomplish that? Um, that one was actual uh, actual footage. It was just using a higher shutter speed so okay. that it caught the one a little bit more clearly than than the normal anyways. So, that was one of the only some of the only real shots. Thank you. take uh, about three years ago out in front of the Westport Coffee House. This is torture for me because I get nervous when I do this, so I'm usually behind the camera. So if you got any questions, ask away. When did you realize uh, that God had given you a gift for heavy metal singing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, the song at the end, I guess fortunately or unfortunately, uh, that's Ron Simone and I singing the lyrics on <laughs> That was a birthday present from an ex-girlfriend of mine that was the inspiration for the film, so however, however that works out. <laughs> yeah? How did you stabilize the image? I mean, was that a steady cam or was that yeah. a Steve Bazant, Bazant from uh, Wichita was a steady cam operator and he deserves a lot of, a lot of credit on that. Uh, we had to watch for reflections in the glass and booms and, uh, and stuff like that. He did a really good job. We probably did about, probably did about 14 times and that's, I think that's number 12. Yeah? Where did Bill end up? Hey, it's a short film. Good question. <laughs> um, what I try to do, this is real theory, about the only thing I learned in film school, um, you know, uh, is it's the Hitchcock has this shared secret where you know there's a bomb, you, the audience members, know there's a bomb playing another, underneath the table, and, and nobody in the film does, so that's a shared secret. What I try to do is let you, as an audience member, know where he's at and nobody else does know. And when you finally go back, you have been kind of did juked and you don't even know where he's at. So, theory behind us. I admired the lighting on that. Was there, how'd you manipulate the light? Sun. That was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that was uh, no reflectors. Uh, well, we actually, that's a good question because we had to pick the, if it was overcast, it would have really hurt. I mean, it was overcast, so that really helped. It wasn't real, a real sunny day. And Woody Van Gogh, he plays the waiter. There's only one scene where uh, he kind of, the camera kind of turns and it pans to him and he gets kind of irised out, you know, so he's just all in black. But that would have, with the steady cam, it's real hard to manipulate the iris while somebody's, while the steady cam operator's moving. So we had to kind of, that's about the only time where the body scooped up. But just a nice day, sunshine lines, as far as the lighting. We did kind of a sound design. Um, Craig Paddock did the sound and we went out a couple days before. Knew a bus would come by at this time, or, or uh, uh, you know, having little, little uh, bit characters say little funny things as, it went, as the camera went by. So, it's the first film I did, so I'm pretty proud of it. It's funny, I did a second one and it sucks. So. <laughs> 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 Kevin 
and the funny thing with this, and I'll, I'll quit talking because I'm so nervous. Um, <laughs> I, at the beginning of the film, uh, uh, he's getting stabbed, and I kept, he, 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 he sounded fake. He sounded like he didn't know, he, just bad acting. You know, my worst actor, thank God, just had to grunt, so. <laughs> He just couldn't get it, couldn't get it. And I says, okay, make it sound like you're going to the bathroom. <laughs> so we kind of nailed it with that, right? So, but I tell you, every time this darn thing starts, it sounds like the guy's on the toilet. <laughs> That's about all I remember from it. How long did you rehearse? Uh, that's a big deal. Um, I'm a firm believer the two most important things are the writing and the acting. Uh, the, the photography comes third and the directing is the easy part. That's the, that's the third part. So rehearsal was a real big deal. We, like I said, we rolled on that thing about 14 times, but we got up at crack of dawn. And, and I, instead of doing it in a, uh, you know, in, in a more rehearsal setting, we just did it there beforehand. And we just keep going back and forth and back and forth. The actors did a good job. A lot of them were theater actors, so they were kind of... Uh, it was kind of anti-film as far as acting-wise. I, I, had, I had to tell them to totally be on the whole time. I mean, my dialogue ends here, but as the camera's over here, you just make up a story, keep talking, and make up a story that'll fit to when it comes back to you. So uh, rehearsals were huge. Um, and I, I tell the actors, if we get, you know, it was about six and a half minutes long, if we get like four minutes into it, you screw up, just keep going. I mean, there was a certain time period where I, you know, I said, just keep going, because it, it was a great take, you know up until then, so if you even, you know, busted a line, just keep going, and that helped out in rehearsals, but... Um, you just rehearsed that day of the shoot? That day, probably 30, 40 times, you know, Rosanna, she could, she could attest to that. And, um, it was great, I had a great experience. Rick Cowan did a great job helping me AD that thing. You know, we had PAs, people had to stop um, for people from walking by, and they had signs up and stuff like that, but it worked out perfect, everything, you know, uh, I thought there'd be people walking in, you know, writing a shot and looking around. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, 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 it turned out really well. So, uh, like I said, I'm really thankful. My third one I'm going to do on film. I'm a news photographer for, at Channel 41. Yeah, you know, yeah, I get all the hey, TV, all of that. So uh, uh, I'm saving up money to do either a really expensive short or a really cheap feature. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know about the slides. Were those projected, or how it was actually? No, we just um, we projected them very small on a on a screen, and then just used a beta cam and just uh, fed it into the Avid just via standard videotape, and then edited it from there. So we tried a, diff a bunch of different ways. We tried scanning them and a bunch of other stuff, and shooting it with beta just overall looked the best. We tried three or four different ways. So, and that was the easiest to cheapest. Uh, so just as part of the same, so the, the photographs were prints or slides? They were slides. Okay. They were slides. And you just aimed the beta cam camera? Yeah, we had the slide projector. And if, if you're going to do that, just make the slide projector, make the picture as small as you possibly can, because it, it's much more even illumination, and it's much brighter. You get better colors and stuff, and then just get the beta cam in there and stick it on macro, and away you go. And then we added the mask in the Avid, all the masking, that uh, was done in the habit and stuff like that. So, so that was yeah. like miniature rear projection or what? I mean, it, it was no, it's just, just videotaping off a screen. Stop. And Kevin had three times as many pictures as that's in the movie. And when he came to me and said, "All right, let's start," and he had stacks of slides. <laughs> and I said, How long is this film? Oh, it's only a few minutes long. And I said, man, we're going to be whipping through these slides. So he had, he had a bunch of sequences in the museum where he tried to animate um, the characters going through the museum, and we were going to just cut them really quickly together. But unfortunately, he didn't. In order to do that correctly, you have to have a, a pin register camera, and it has to be on a tripod, because if it moves, and, and it's obvious in the last few. So we just, there were sequences of 20 slides that we used three just because we tried editing them together quickly and it was just it didn't make any sense so that was that was one thing he had a lot more pictures than we ended up showing but 
I think it works better actually with the slower picker. Was there an exterior of the museum that had some like hazy lights? Yeah, I don't know what he did there. He had again he had a whole bunch of photos there, and I think what he did was just set the camera up and run around with like light sticks and just sort of do this on strings and uh, so that, you know, he, I think he went out dressed in black and just sort of waved shit, uh, stuff around. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, just kept, just kept the frame open. Because um, some of them he had were, were just really bizarre and then some of them weren't, didn't come out very well at all. So we kind of used the middle, the middle. How was the audience accepting that song last time? The audience really liked it at South by Southwest. It went over really well. Um, it's sort of unusual, it's more like an AV show, if you've ever been to museums or whatever and seen AV shows, it's, it's more like that, but I think that's a great way um, to tell a story, you know, it's just with photographs and putting them together, I think it's a fabulous way to, you know, to, to make a film if you can't afford thousands of feet of 16, um, a whole lot of rolls of 35 in your camera is, is a lot cheaper and I think it's just as effective for something like this. You know, as, as a mock museum piece, I think it, I think it works great, and the audience in South by Southwest really liked it. So, um, I thought it was a real, a real fun project to work on. Are we supposed to still tell Kevin that he only got the plaque and no money? Yeah, don't tell him he got the check. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, thank you all. Note this the Jubilee is a collaborative event with the Film Society, you one from Pants. Oh. <laughs> I've got the Astro Lab Award, it's $500 in post production services. Tender and she got the Jubilee Prize. It's a two hundred dollar check from the Jubilee. And Ahmad, is he here? Ahmad is uh, giving the Lonely Seal Pictures Award to Catherine Naples for Lorelei. Two VIP tickets to any concert at the House of Blues coming up, plus two passes to the private room at the House of Blues in Los Angeles. Chris, Chris, and uh, Jeff, and their uh, stand-in, they got the Panavision Prize. It's a uh, week. Uh, or two weeks of camera rental from Panavision. Depends on what kind of camera they get to rent or get, whether it's two weeks or one week. But that's Panavision out of Dallas.
Yeah. Yeah, that was 16 millimeter transferred to uh, you know digital realm to do the stop motion. Thank you. Uh, Philip Lawson does my soundtracks. He's no longer living in the area. Um, he actually gave me that soundtrack in about five different pieces, and I, I put it together myself. So. Anyone else? Yes? Tell us the story of the super the tear. A lot of people wonder how I got that. That was a crystal that I super glued to my face. Uh, and ripped off and super glued it and ripped off uh, about 10 times to get the tear to roll down my. It's anything for art. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
What was the music from? Um, that was Niels Nielsen. He uh, composed an original composition for the movie, an original score. Are you submitting it anywhere else? Um, yeah, I should. I, I'm going to submit it, hopefully. It made the Humboldt Festival, but I haven't gone to composite, so that's a problem. I'm not sure if they're going to be able to screen it on video. It's about 1500 to get a composite, so we'll see. Did you have a seagull wrangler? <laughs> yeah, it's all luck. What's your senior project? Um, it's called The Watchers, and it's based on a Sarah Orne Jewett novel. I don't know if you've heard of the writer. Uh, just a short story. Um, it's about two old women who stay up the wake of a funeral. And I decided this time to do completely work on character development. Um, so this was production value, and this next one I really try to test my directing skills. So I'm, I'm working on a soundtrack for that right now. And I was trying to get a shot of an old house out here. So. And when is that going to screen? Um, I'm hoping to have it done by the end of May. Is there an so. LMU screening now? Oh, uh, it already screened at LMU. Oh, did it? Yeah, but I'm still working. So I'm sorry, you're from here and you just go to school out here? Um, yeah, I, I moved here in high school. And now I go to school in Los Angeles. Exactly how you know about ten or something. 
But the circuits, you know, you have a year basically after you complete the film, and then it kind of expires. So you can't submit it. You know, it has to be made within a year of the festival dates. All right. Well, um, thanks a lot. <laughs>